we are joined today um, by the Deputy Minister in the Presidency for Women, um, Youth and People with Disabilities, Professor Hengi Omkize, who is no stranger to the higher education space, having been our, deputy, uh, our Minister of Higher Education and Training before. Thank you so much, Prof, for joining us. Um, we will be introducing the rest of the panelists as we go along. I want now to take it all to Dr. Amnika Luwalia, who is the CEO of Higher Health, to give us a perspective on why we are here today and why we are having this discussion. Dr. Amnik, over to you. Um, Florence, thank you. Uh, such an honor to have uh, the Honorable uh, Deputy Minister, Professor Shingiran Kize here with us. This has all started under her leadership and she was a Deputy Minister um, of the Department of Higher Education and also when she was the Minister of Higher Education. And I'm very grateful for her presence. Uh, I'm also very grateful to my fellow participants and panelists who are here with us. And uh, it's, it's a mix of academics, uh, vice chancellors, mix of uh, TVET rectors, students who every day face this epidemic on a daily basis here with us. So, so very grateful to all of you and very chairperson of CGE, uh, Tamara, also joining us. While there are many uh, critical panelists, uh, other participants on the Zoom, Zoom channel with us, and also the ones who are tuning in through our media channels, uh, and thanks to the media partners for, for helping us in this regard. You're right, Florence, gender-based violence is a global pandemic, and a pandemic that has, has taken South Africa to another extreme, uh, embedded into our communities. The worst thing about this pandemic is it's not a one-dimensional health disease that you can, you can cure it. It's a multi-dimensional pandemic embedded into our communities. It kills the physical, the mental well-being, and it destroys the entire community from inside. It's a parasite that is absolutely uh, killing the entire post-school education as well as the country in general. And I think I'm very fortunate that today we will engage in the purpose of this virtual roundtable is to hear the voices right from a student, an academic, and, and the leadership in itself uh, to understand what do we do in order for us to engage this pandemic head on. Uh, we cannot live with this pandemic. That's the reality. We have to one day end this pandemic. Um, we as men, if we are responsible, then we have to find mechanisms of how men take responsibility to end this pandemic. If women are on the forefront of this pandemic, they need to guide us what is best to keep them safe, to keep every gender safe in this country. We are very honored uh, that the, the, the Honorable Minister this week launched the policy framework for the entire reset system. It's this week that the history is made, a momentous week for the post-school education training, a momentous week for us as higher health a journey that started in 2017, uh, hoping that we will build something credible, an uh, infrastructure that will guide every institution of higher learning how to fight gender-based violence is now a reality. The cabinet has given its approval under the leadership of the presidency, under the leadership of the deputy minister Mkize, this policy now becomes a practical living reality for the sector. And I think this is very timely today that we discuss the policy is now there. A lot of work went into the policy, right from a research that our baseline since 1970s, that we could see the scourge of gender-based violence in every institution of higher learning, whether it's a UCT, a Rhodes, or a TVET college in Bizana, or, or in Ladysmith, or anywhere in rural or informal settlement. We are a big sector. So, so, Prime Director, the purpose of this day is to discuss not the reality of gender-based violence, but a very important question, which even higher health is very keen to know what comes next. We've got a huge plan for us, but we want to test whether these plans are real. Can we have a comprehensive gender-based violence uh, a plan or program in place? Can a sexual harassment uh, from the employer perspective, we put straight, can we have policies at every institution? 
Can we have statements at every institutional level that every student and staff is able to read? Can we have prevention programs? Can we have safety and security? Can we put capacity? Can reporting be easy? Can we have disciplinary uh, processes in place? Can systems be put, controls be put, so that at every level, we make sure a young life is preserved. But I think, Florence, this will come during the purpose. And I'm equally honored that after me, Florence, through your permission, will be a, a very important address from somebody I have grown up uh, looking into, working with her. She, used, she was my first deputy minister who actually made the TVET program a practical reality um, from where we were. And I'm so honored that Professor Nkise will, uh, will give us those important direction, what comes next. Over to you, uh, Program Director. I'm very grateful for the time. Thank you. Deputy Minister in the Presidency for um, Women, Youth and People with Disability is now with us. Um, Professor Mkize, if you can please unmute your microphone and join us to give us direction as to what must happen once this policy reaches each campus of um, the post-school sector. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, loud and clear. Thank you, Prof. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, as usual, for kind words from Dr. Ramnik and Walia, colleagues from higher education and Tibet colleges, and students who are members of the panel, I acknowledge you. Our dialogue today takes place really amidst a devastating outbreak of COVID-19, of which its impact will be felt over a long period of time, particularly by women, young women, youth, persons with disabilities, and of course the LGBTQIA plus, community as these groups continue to be the most disadvantaged in our society. This pandemic has laid bare the deep rooted fault lines of inequality that are entrenched in our society. Inequalities, discrimination, prejudice, biogotry, sexism, and homophobia have a long history which manifests itself in patriarchal toxic and harmful practices and negatively impact the most vulnerable sectors of our society. Because of mass media vigilance, GBVF strike not only the victim and the immediate family, but the society at large. In the context of the given theme in this dialogue, institutions like colleges or universities should be thinking about the extent of secondary trauma. The shock waves run throughout the whole organization. The public outcry and the media attention, sometimes not so sensitive, leave a young person extremely agitated, nervous, fearful, and anxious with a loss of memory and difficulty in studying, in falling asleep, in some instances, young people develop anxiety and depression and even suicidal thoughts. In a worst case scenario, they drop out of the college. On leaving home, many of our young people would already have been exposed to multi forms of violation. So new forms of victimization away from home triggers off or re-traumatizes them unfortunately at the time when they are on their own. Before we started producing the kind of policy that we're gonna be unpacking, you'll find that a, you know, a student will be afraid even to report a matter. There will be no mechanisms as to how to handle it. Young women of South Africa though, have said enough is enough. They've called for interventions with greater impact. So the PSET GBV policy framework to cap and manage cases of GBVF is welcomed. 
It is a timely response to the sketch. We thank both the Minister and the Deputy Minister of Higher Education, Science and Innovation for an astute leadership role. We acknowledge the alignment with the National Strategic Plan, which was received in May 2020 and presented to the public by our President, His Excellency Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa. The NSP, as it has come to be known, has the following pillars. I think it's important to just highlight them briefly because I have said the policy of higher education is in line with the national framework, the NSP. The, the first pillar talks to accountability, coordination and leadership. Firm leadership and strengthened accountability that responds to the GBVF crisis in a multi-sectoral strategically and in institutionally coherent and resourced way is critical. At our level, at a national level, we, are, we, we have formed some structures so that each and every person who is contributing towards eliminating the sketch could be accountable and to ensure high level coordination and of course the point of leadership. And that first pillar will apply to our institutions as well. The second pillar is very, very important. It talks to prevention and rebuilding social cohesion. Stopping violence before it happens and a national drive towards shifting away from toxic masculinities restoring human dignity and rebuilding the social fabric. And I'm sure you will all agree with me that that's where we ought to put attention, especially when young people enter our institutions of higher learning. To, the question is, what is it that we need to put in place which will ensure that they do not become victims or casualties? What kind of a social uh, milieu we, we can create which will promote safety, protect them against perpetrators? There's a third element of justice, safety, and protection. Uh, the Minister of Justice has looked at our laws and is talking about those that ought to be uh, re reviewed so as to ensure uh, so as to strengthen the criminal justice system. I think that's an important element as well, that perpetrators should be held accountable. Otherwise, if we promote impunity, the element of response, care, support, and healing is also very, very important. Where young people have been victimized, as I said earlier on, they end up, opt they, they end up failing completely where there's no support, uh, where there are no opportunities to deal with their pain and loss or whatever they are going through. Uh, those who are not strong enough uh, start thinking, maybe I need to take some time off. And it, that's where they lose financial support and sometimes get lost in a system co completely. The other element of the pillar is to look at economic power. Uh, you know, power is an important aspect in dealing with this. If we don't pay particular attention uh, as to how there is a redistribution of power relations uh, when it comes to economic opportunities, then more women will be victimized. But in the context of institutions, I just want to flag this that if, for instance, a student is sexually harassed by somebody important like a supervisor of a thesis or somebody like a professor or a lecturer, it becomes extremely difficult uh, because there are all sorts of considerations that a student will worry about, uh, even in terms of saying, uh, what if this person fail me? And in some instances, perpetrators start off by saying, oh, you know, you have to defend your thesis. 
but all other uh, supervisors have failed you. I'm the only one who can rescue you. And you know, poverty, insecurity, people end up uh, giving in. The, the last point which is relevant to institutions of higher learning is a question of research and information management. Availability of gender-based violence and femicide information across uh, different sectors is very, very important. At the moment, even in the institutions of higher learning, we know a lot about cases that have been driven by the media. It will be important to continuously do research and be able to account in terms of who are people who get victimized under what circumstances, who are perpetrators, and be transparent about it. In this age, we can even put it out uh, there and, and, and talk about it openly and let perpetrators be known and limit their chances of taking positions of employment within a campus. Coming back to the lockdown, which started on March 26, a number of despicable and senseless murders happened. Women are facing a double pandemic, emanating from the fear of COVID-19, experiencing anxiety about the number of deaths that are reported on a daily basis, and in some instances, struggling with personal loss and grief. GBVF becomes an extra burden for women. Once we are victim-centered, mental health issues feature strongly, whether we are thinking about prevention programs or interventions within the criminal justice systems, victims bear a burden of memory and they suffer from immense pain, memory gaps, denials, and deliberate avoidance of reliving the experience. Hence, we have to mobilize resources and ensure that victims are cushioned. Participation of young male students in GBVF dialogues will enrich the implementation of the PSET GBV policy framework on the sketch. We're looking forward to a transformation value of the policy, hopefully increased funding of mental wellness and mental health programs on campus, improved infrastructure built, re-examination of modes of transport, especially for those who are residing off campus. When I talk infrastructure, it could be even just uh, some lights between uh, the university and where students attend, so as to make sure that they are safe. The United Nations emphasizes the importance of promotion and prevention. They advise that mental health promotion and prevention intervention should aim to strengthen individuals' capacity to regulate emotions, enhance alternatives to risk-taking behaviors like alcohol, substance abuse, uh, build resilience into difficult situations and adversities, and promote supportive social environments and social networks. They further recommend that such programs require a multi-level approach with varied delivery platforms. Today, we are a technology-driven society, and I hope there'll be special platforms which will assist uh, many young people who are under a threat and, and avoid the actual violation. It is our wish that our young people should be in the forefront when it comes to the implementation of the PSET GBV policy framework. So as to ensure that this generation eliminates all forms of GBVF in their lifetime. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Minister. However, now I would like to ask um, our students who have their bit to share with us 
to please be prepared and to anybody who is near them to offer them the requisite support. I would like us um, now to please welcome uh, Lucy and please take your space. Um, greetings to everyone. Um, my name is Lucy and I'm a student at the Central University of Technology, um, specifically at the Velcom campus. Um, I'm a third year student at um, doing BEd EMS. Gender-based violence in and of itself is not something that necessarily just affects that one person that experiences it, but it also affects how that person interacts with people that they live with, people that they are in relationships or even in friendships with, right? So in essence, um, like um, Prof. Kiza has already um, highlighted on the issue that this has a ripple effect and does not necessarily just affect the one person who physically experienced the hand of GBBF, right? As an individual, my personal experience is twofold in that in 2014, I was a matriculant at Belcom High School. And on my way home, on one afternoon after my debate practice, um, I bumped into some guy who needed direction somewhere, but because I was not from that neighborhood, I could not assist him. Um, me being oblivious to things, I just went along my way to, um, on my way home. So this guy seemingly was following me on the way home. And um, I think we seem to be having uh, technical problems there with Lucy. Um... Back in 2018 February, um, I was on my way back from campus because I usually walk home because it's not like that big of a distance to walk home. And the sort of route that I took every single day without having to worry about whether somebody's gonna follow me or not. Because even with the experience that I had before then, I didn't go around looking at people thinking that they're these terrible monsters and they're out to hurt me. Even on that particular day, I didn't suspect that anything bad would happen because this was a route that I was familiar with. This was an activity that I did every single day going to and from campus. But unfortunately, even then, I don't know where this guy came from. I don't even remember him being anywhere along the route. And he too raped me. And... Even then, I did the same thing that I did the last time. I got up and I dusted myself off and I kept walking home. When I got home, um, I remember I didn't even tell my brother that this had happened. I only told him, I think, the day afterwards. And I remember how it was difficult for me to tell him because even when something that bad happens to you, you still want to sort of protect the people that you care about. You don't want them to feel the hurt that you feel. And that's how I felt. So I had to tell my brother and the reason why it was easier to talk to him about it was because he's a cop. So I figured he will give me a very rational and very logical way to get about doing things, what my next step should be, because that's the type of person that I am. I try to rationalize and I try to make everything as logical as possible. I don't really want to fall into the idea of emotions too much. So I managed to tell him and he had to call my mom and tell my mom that this had happened, which was something that I didn't want him to do because at the end, I know that it was gonna break her and I didn't want that. I, I always wanted to protect my mom, even if it meant suffering on my own. And I think that also, is part of the problem that as individuals we become so obsessed with trying to protect other people even when we're hurting that it becomes difficult for us to talk about things and talk about things that need to be said things that need to be known things that need to be dealt with immediately because if i don't do something about it it's gonna happen to somebody else and this is why particularly for me, um, these sorts of seminars and these sorts of discussions are important because it may have happened to me and I may have gotten over it. 
and I may have been able to move on with my life and not necessarily fallen into the abyss of being a victim, but rather I'm a survivor because I don't believe in being a victim. And I remember that this one time when I had to report on campus that the reason why I was not attending um, lectures for a certain period of time was because during those certain um, periods, I had to go for counseling as suggested by my case handler. And that's what I was doing. But I remember the lecturer telling me that, no, I don't look like somebody who was raped. And I couldn't understand that because what is a person who's raped supposed to look like? Because for all you know, any random person could have been raped, but they chose not to look like their problem. So I think the very fact that we have people who are in academics who hold offices of importance in academics, especially in higher education, those individuals who still have these weird ideas of what a victim should look like, regardless of the circumstances of the crime. I think that that is one of the biggest problems that we need to address. And we think, what I also think is that even if we're going to have these frameworks and these laws and these policies that are put into place, what's important as much as government could put pen on paper and make a document that suggests what we ought to do, we don't think that we actively achieve that if nobody, specifically the individuals in the public, specifically the individuals who enable the sort of behavior to continue, we don't think that those people don't change how they view themselves and how they view certain situations, that we will actively get the change that we want. Because ultimately, we can talk all we want. We can give you all the statistics all we want. We can report that there are five girls that were killed today, seven that were raped yesterday. We can tell you all of these numbers, but it doesn't change the fact that ultimately, there is somebody out there that thinks it's okay to just victimize somebody, that thinks it's okay to sort of want to hold power over another individual. And we also think that those individuals also have a, a sort of support system, people who enable that sort of behavior, who enable that sort of behavior, who don't hold them accountable, especially those closest to them. Because we think that if the individuals that are closest to you shun you for your behavior, because it's unacceptable, because it's painful to the next person, then only can we have the sort of change that we want. We need you to call that person out in public, such that they know that people know what they did and so that they can be held accountable. Because without accountability, then this whole process, we can have frameworks, we can have all these policies and all these laws that don't necessarily achieve what we want at the end. I'm not the problem. I can tell you what happened to me. I'm not the problem. The problem is the people that decide it's okay to just read somebody. It's okay to take somebody else's child's life people who think it's okay to hurt the next person. The truth is sometimes we do have situations where we live in a society that sort of wants to have this weird idea of what men should be and what women should be. If we change those sorts of rhetorics, then we think at the end, if we change how people view each other, then only can we be able to have these sorts of discussions and sort of have valuable change or valuable discourse from those particular discussions because we think we neglect a lot of things. We focus too much on, I, sometimes I feel that we focus too much on the story of the rape itself and we don't necessarily look at why the rape happened. There's this weird stigmatization that is attached to victims, that victims are supposed to look a certain way or you were raped because you were dressed a certain way, you were raped because you think you're smart, you were raped because a skirt was too short, because your boobs were hanging out. It's not about the victim. The problem here is the perpetrator. We need to find what's wrong with people who think it's okay to rape people, with people who think it's okay um, to kill children and to kill women and to kill those individuals who can't defend themselves. We think that that's what we should be addressing here. Because at the end, if you're going to yeah, say no, that she's... the policy or framework is valuable, then it should be valuable in a sense that um, 
we are actively dealing with the problem. We could have all the fruits of the problem, this being the rape or the after effects of the rape. But what leads to rape can pick the apples from the tree, but the tree is going to remain. But if you dig out the tree from the roots, then you get rid of the tree. And that's what we want. We want to deal with the problem from its root cause and not just from what we think might be the problem. Before we can actively address the whole issue, we need to deal with the stakeholders and get the stakeholders to be held accountable for how they contribute to the issue, right? And that ultimately is how we're going to solve this and how we're going to have genuine discourse and valuable change at the end of the day. And with that, I'd like to thank you. Thank you so much once again, Lucy, for being a strong and a brave voice um, for this fight. Thank you for using what you have experienced to help empower others. And thank you for giving us a lot of food for thought. I would like now um, to please welcome Unom Velum Gokri, who is in uh, the Eastern Cape. She's at King Hinza College. Hello, Sisi Unjani. I'm good, ma'am. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let me take this opportunity to greet everyone at large. My name is Nomvelo. My surname is Mkulkri. I am 23 years old. I'm studying at King Initiative College. I am doing N6 at, in Human Resource Management. I won't be too long, but I want to share my story. I will start about my background. I was born in Free State. My mother and my father were not married. They just met each other in 1989. Then they began a friendship. They made four children. I am the third born of those four children. I grew up without my mother. I asked my father about my mother because we've been growing up asking him, where is my mother? He used to tell us that your mother is not here because she was a slut. She was sleeping around every man. Then she died of diseases. So when he told us that in 2013, back, I was involved in a relationship and I was very young that time. I was 16 years old. 2013, December, Friday, I went to visit my boyfriend and that was the first time I slept with her boyfriend. I got pregnant. After I have got pregnant, he told me that that child is not for him and he doesn't know me. He denied me in front of my family. He denied me in front of his family. He denied me in front of my friends at school. So by 2015, in 2014, I had to be a mother at age of 17 years old. Remember, I grew up without my mom and I knew nothing about love. But all I was doing, I was longing because I grew up only with my brothers. My brother, the elderly brother, was responsible for our care. And my father was not there to support us. He was not doing anything to support us. My brother was responsible for our growth. So as I grew up, I was like that person. I wanted to be loved to the point that I was fumbling, looking all over, everybody who's saying, I love you. I thought he meant what he said. But when the product of being pregnant came, he told me that, no, don't come with me. Don't come to me and claim that I am the father of your child. I won't be responsible for that. Same 2015, I tried everything to kill myself because I was very young and I was scared of my friends. How will I put it, being pregnant, having no father of the child, that is impossible for me. And I never imagined myself becoming a parent at age of 17 years old. One day I was sleeping and I heard a voice in a dream saying, no, your mother is alive. When I told everybody at home, they didn't believe me. I woke up in the morning, went to Alistair to look for my mother. I think I took almost 30 days staying at Alice, 
and I was staying on the streets because I had no one to go, but I was looking for my mom. Fortunate enough, at the end of March 2015, I got my mother. She was alive. My mother told us that the reason she didn't raise us is because our father has stabbed her six times, tried to kill her in free state. She locked her in a shack, then took us by 2005, moved with us to Eastern Cape. So when my mother came to confess that by 2015, they were every day fighting, fighting, fighting. So I was in the side of my mom because I thought that my life would change and my life will get a, 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 a settlement. My father beated me. He beated me physically. He abused me. He was insulting me that you are a wife, you are not a girl. You have no value. You, are, you have a child, but you are a child. You are going up and down. Even if you can die, I don't mind, I can bury you. That was my father telling me that. I went to the church because I was looking for help. Inside the church, I got a proposal for marriage. And I thought, okay, maybe since I was going through a lot, this is the time for me to settle my life. I agreed with the pastor to take the marriage. Remember, I am 18 years old by 2015, end of September. After I have I agreed with the pastor for the marriage, he came at home, visited my home, and bring 5,000 for a lobola. After bringing that 5,000 for a lobola, he told me that I must come to fit the dress because he was organizing a white wedding. Before that thing happened, he forced me to sleep with him, but there was no marriage yet that time. And while he was sleeping with me, I never agreed to sleep with him. So he was forcing me saying, I gave you the money, the 5,000 rand for the lobola is already in your family. So you are belonging to me. I can do whatever I want to do because now you are my wife. But by that time there was no marriage. So when the day of marriage came, it came already, I was already disturbed in my mind because like I hated myself. I hated myself like, like never before because I was going under a lot of things. 2016, beginning of 2016 by April, my elder brother was going to a graduation. He was going to graduate because he was corresponding at UNISA University. He got, he got an accident. He died. After he died, he was buried on the 23rd of April, 2016. After three days, my mother died. After that, they have died. That pastor came at school. Imagine I was a child. This person is a pastor. He can preach, he can prophesy, he can do everything. But the way he, he was abusing my life, was contradicting the authority he had. Because I will say he was using the authority of being a pastor. He came to me to tell me that you see your mother is dead. You see your brother is dead. It is because you refused to be my wife. If you agreed with me and became my wife, such things, they would never happen in your life. So again, I started down like doubting myself why I was born. Why I am living because I, I, I'm feeling myself valueless. I passed grade 12 in 2017. After I have passed grade 12, I went to Cape Town. That was 2018. But even in Cape Town, when I reached my cousin's sisters, they told me, hey, don't be, we won't be looking after yourself. You have to make means so that you eat. You have to make means so that you will be clothing. So I saw, no, now I have to sell myself to the men's so that they give me money, so that I survive, so that I will be having nice clothes. I saw that being at Cape Town, it won't work for me. I came back to Eastern Cape. After coming back to Eastern Cape, mind that we don't have home. My, my father never built even a shack. We don't have home. We stay around the village. Even if, I would be glad, even if you people who are listening now may bring help because it seems as if our lives, we are, we are growing up with the struggle. We don't have home, we stay all over the village. 
I don't know the mercy of government saying all, uh, all, all children who are struggling have to get the laptops, have to be the NS, NS first beneficiaries. I made the application several times. I don't have NS first. Even in the community, I have no say. In, in, in the people of my age, I have no say because at, in my institution at Willowville campus, there are people there who know that I don't have home. So I am the president of the campus in SRC. Sometimes it becomes difficult for me to address the students because between those students, some of them, they know my background. They know that I don't have home. They know that I was once raped. They know that I have a kid at an early age. So it's not an easy job to be in the SRC. After going through a lot, I need help, a serious help. Even now, I don't know what to say because everything that government is claiming to send for the people out there in the communities, it just ends in the capital cities or in the towns. About us in the villages, they forget. I plead you, I need help about my situation because Sometimes I'm feeling like killing myself now and again, but I have a child. So if I kill myself, I have to kill myself and kill my child. That won't happen. I have my young sister. She's suffering from a chronic illness. I can't mention her chronic illness. I have to support her, but how do I support her? Because I have nothing. I myself, my alone. My brother is eat every kind of drug, is using every kind of drug. So I want government to outline the, the, the sentence of poverty, because at some point the poverty is the, is the weapon that drives us as young people into the desperation. Once you become hungry, immediately you become hungry. Even if you, you, you stay in capital town or you stay in the village, hungry is the same. Once you become hungry, you change the way you see things. You change the way you think you change the way you, you start to, to, to see, to view the community, to view people, because you, you develop the negative attitude. Other people end up being prostitutes. Other people, they end up becoming thieves. They steal, not because it's their motive to steal, but the hungerness drives them to do negative things. So I, I'm living life of mercy, and not just me. Me, I'm counseling other students at school. Because as much as my, my situation is worse, other people, when they look at me, they saw a better person. Because when I walk, I tell myself that I am me, non velo, and I love myself. I am proud of myself. I won't sacrifice the dignity that is left for myself just because I know that I have gone through a lot. When I went to Cape Town, the other guy said, I will offer you a job, but you have to give me something in return. I asked him, what will I give you? Because I'm here longing for money. I will work for you, then you'll pay me. He told me, no, you must visit me in my room before you get to this job. Bring the CV and bring yourself so that we hire you. I had grade 12 that time. I said, no, I must go to Eastern Cape. Life out there, it's not easy. It's not easy for people who are educated because even if you've got the metric, you've got the certificate, I have to sacrifice with myself. What if that person is, po is positive, HIV positive? He wants to sleep with me, then will leave me with the disease. Then I struggle again with the depression. So there are a lot of things we are facing out there. There are a lot of things. And as for my life, I can talk the whole day because I have been through a lot, but for now, I think I have to stop here because this thing of my background, it hurts me. I was once tagged in Facebook. The other child, the other child used to stay in my community, my community, tagged me on Facebook and talk about what I am saying now on Facebook. I didn't give her the right to share my life in Facebook, but she did that. And again, I tried to kill myself because at times I feel like Everybody is looking at me because they, there's something these people, they know about me. Sometimes I lose focus. I do pass. I pass with the distinctions. I don't, want, I don't know how is it happening because I'm dealing with a lot, but there is only one person who is making me stronger and stronger every day, my spiritual mother. She is there for me, always, always telling me that, Tombi, I love you. That is what I was looking for from my growth. 
So I think for now I must stop then. Thank you. Thank you for being the brave young woman that you are. And um, I am truly sorry that we have let you down. Society keeps letting you down over and over again. I'm aware that um, there's a team from the Deputy Minister's Office here on the DHEAD side. I think your NSFAS issues can be immediately taken care of. Whew. Deputy Minister Mkize, um, I think this is one for you to note because interventions are needed for non velo immediately. It's not something we can wait to say, we'll see what can happen in the next month. It will be very important um, that uh, somehow um, a team reaches out and finds her and gives her um, the assistance that she and her siblings need um, during this time and, and, and moving forward. Thank you very much, Nomvelo, uh, that you've taken time and agreed to share a truly heart-wrenching story, but here you are still standing. Continue to be strong, and it is up to us then to make sure that we don't let you down beyond this webinar that the right help that you're crying out for gets afforded to you. And goes. Whew. With that, um, I'm going to give time to the chairperson of the Commission for Gender Equality, um, Ms. Tamara Matebula. Thank you, uh, Program Director. Um, it, you know, it's, it, it's very difficult to speak after the two powerful young women that are still standing strong after their life, uh, you know, experiences. Um, and I must say that uh, perhaps from the Commission for Gender Equality, uh, these are some of the issues that we deal with them on, on daily basis. Um, and from the Commission for Gender Equality, we are there as a chapter nine institution that is it's there to actually pro protect constitutional democracies, the rights of people, young people, Abafana um, Velo, and the Lucy's of our day. You must know that the institution is there for you. Uh, if anyone violates your rights or discriminate you on the basis of gender, sex, marriage, pregnancy, or any other thing, the institution is there to knock on the doors and we are there in all provinces, all nine provinces we have offices. You can download uh, information and, and, and you can get information on our websites as well as complaint forms and you send those complaints uh, on violations and we will definitely follow up on the cases that we have reported. Thank you so much for sharing so much this morning with us. Uh, mine basically is to actually share uh, information, an investigation that we did from 2014, looking at the uh, status of institutions of higher learning uh, in the country. And we came up with uh, quite a lot of findings uh, which are in our report. And we also made some recommendations on what needs to be done. And I must say that one of those recommendations that we brought was the development of the policy framework that we are launching today. And we are quite excited, and this is an exciting time uh, for the commission to actually see that one of our recommendations has actually been realized uh, by the institutions, and we will be there just to make sure that we monitor its implementation. Because I think one of the things that Nonvelo talked about, and Lucy was saying that we do have laws, but most of those laws are just there in papers implementation of the laws is a bit pro problematic in the country. And I think this is also going to be one of the things that we will follow up in terms of the implementation, the rollout of this uh, policy framework in all institutions, in all universities, technical colleges or TVET colleges, and we'll make sure that we support them with any other technical support that will be required in terms of making sure that it's realized in all institutions. Just by way of uh, just giving a background, we are, we are a chapter nine institution um, that has a constitutional mandate to promote the protection, the development and the attainment of gender equality. So the constitutional obligation of CGE actually mandates us to monitor and hold any entity, whether it's a public or a private sector, we, we are holding all these 
institutions into account for not actually implementing their obligations. So we are there to just make sure that we hold people into account. One of the things that Lucy strongly felt uh, that this is something that needs to be done. To date, we have investigated a total of 22 institutions of higher learning uh, in the form of universities and TVET colleges. Uh, and we started our work in 2014. So what we did was to just make sure that uh, we issue out or dispatch a questionnaire to all these 22 institutions. And that questionnaire was later analyzed and interrogated by the Commission for Gender Equality. We looked at the qualitative and we looked at the quantitative side of the information that we received. And we made sure that after our investigation, we develop what we call preliminary report. And that preliminary report that we developed actually made us to actually call the institutions uh, to what we call uh, investigative hearings. And those hearings are nothing else but to actually subpoena those institutions that we investigated to come and appear before the commission uh, to account for non-compliance with some of the policies that we will be talking about uh, later, such as the Employment Equity Act and other gender-related legislations. And I think one of the concerns that we had, um, and that actually prompted us to go out and do the investigations, there were concerns that were actually coming out from the media. There were complaints that were brought to us as the Commission for Gender Equality. And those complaints revolved around slow pace of gender transformation in the institutions of higher learning. But I must also mention that some of the complaints were really related to unfair labor practices uh, and not actually observing a labor le uh, legislations uh, within the institutions of a, 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 a higher learning. Most of the complaints that we also received uh, were complaints uh, that were brought by the media and students themselves, as well as employees in the institutions of higher learning. And some of the institutions or people that come forward or came forward to actually give us information, they gave us information um, on allegations that were saying that in the institutions there were sexual harassment cases that were happening and some of those cases did not even actually see the light of the day. There were disturbing reports uh, that were coming from the media uh, of students who were sexually abused in the campus as well as outside campuses. And actually uh, some of the information was saying that a case of a woman, of, of a woman uh, they were not placed in the right directions, whether they do have uh, qualifications, whether they did have necessary skills, they were not actually promoted to become professors, to become um, you know, decision makers within the institutions. And there were cases of uh, persons with disabilities who were not also promoted. And some cases were the cases of uh, persons, uh, LGBTIQA communities. And these people were qualified and they were not promoted because they were discriminated against because they were not um, looked at as people that can actually hold the high office. I must say that one of the interesting cases that were brought by students was the whole issue of sex for Max. Um, and this is a big narrative that I would like us as a panel and, and participants really look, look at, because I think there is a narrative out there whether it should be called sex for Max or Max for sex. Because if it's sex for Max, it implies that a student would actually go to the lecturer and say, because I want better Max, uh, let's have sex. Whereas in other cases, if you see the reverse part of it, it's usually the lecturer who says, I will give you better results, let's have sex. So there's a huge narrative around this, which we need to talk about and perhaps correct. One of our key findings uh, by the Commission for Gender Equality was that <clears throat> Employment Equity Act or the legislations that were there most of the higher in institutions of higher learning did not actually comply to the Employment Equity Act, the law that promotes equity in the workplace. That ensures that all employees, 
receive equal opportunities and they are unfairly discriminated against based on the gender, based on the fact that they are living or they have disabilities or they are members of the LGBTI. And again, these were some of the areas that we actually looked at closely. We looked at the executive structures. We looked at the progress made if there were people that were slowly voted into these executive structures. And in the form of uh, professors, the vice chancellors, and if you look at the number of vice, female vice chancellors in our institutions, you can count them, they are very few compared to their male counterparts. We further looked at the issues of um, uh, gaps that were emanating from the remuneration of employees and there were discrepancies here. There was a wage gap. Um, and for the same work that they are doing, for the same number of hours that they are doing, and for the same kind of uh, uh, occupied kind of skills and experiences, female professors were paid less than the male professors. The third area that we looked at was the scourge of gender-based violence um, and femicide, which was on the increase and it was on the alarming rate in the institutions of ILM. There were cases that were reported in the media and there were cases that were reported by students and by employees themselves. And we can remember some of those cases started in Rhodes universities, universities of Pretoria and also incidences um, in, inside and outside campuses. And there were generic discrimination or discriminatory practices um, that were reported uh, by members uh, or employees and, and, and students uh, who were um, uh, students with disabilities and who were students and employees, uh, members of LGBTIQI community. So we looked at the sexual harassment policies in these institutions. And they were in existence in some institutions. And in some institutions, there were no gender related policies that existed. And we made strong recommendations that those policies should actually be developed. And those policies should be accessible to staff members and to students. They must at least have knowledge uh, of those policies and what the policies contained. And these recommendations were actually saying that this is the information that can be shared when an employee or a staff member is um, admitted into an institution as part of the induction. And it can actually be further shared with students in their first week of orientation, just to make sure that students are aware of what uh, and when can they report some kind of sexual harassment in an institution. Some of the things that we found was that the universities and colleges have introduced helplines, which are whistleblower lines to report uh, structural harassment, uh, discriminations, but they did not have any mechanism put in place to eradicate gender-based violence for staff members as well as students. And you will find that most of those cases that were reported via these whistleblower lines were not actually taken into consideration and they were not actually finalized in terms of making sure that they go through the, dis uh, the disciplinary uh, process or hearings and, and make sure that perpetrators within the institutions and, and outside the institutions are actually brought to book. And one of the key recommendations that we made in recognition of the extent and the serious, seriousness of the challenges within the universities and TVET colleges was that perhaps the basic key thing was to make sure that the DHEAD, which is the Department of Higher Education and Training, should develop a policy and a strategic framework that will give guide to all universities and all TVET colleges uh, in the development and implementation of their own policy and strategic frameworks to address gender-based violence. So what we are, uh, sharing today and what we are sort of like uh, uh, talking about today and, the, and, 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 and making sure that this policy is a policy that will guide all universities, all TVET colleges to develop their own strategies. So this will actually uh, you know, be one of our guide or guidelines that will help everyone to, to align to the strategic framework that we are launching today. 
So we as Commission for Gender Equality and other chapter nine institutions, we will be there to monitor the implementation uh, of this particular framework. And we will make sure that compliance by all universities and TVET colleges to the gender frameworks or gender-based violence and femicide frameworks are adhered to. And we will assist with constant review of this particular framework. And we will make sure that we bring along some of the stakeholders that can assist uh, TVET colleges and universities uh, to make sure that this framework is not just a paper that collects dust from the shelves, but it's a paper that can be implemented. And we are willing to work closely with student formations, say community uh, organizations, uh, civil society organizations uh, on a number of uh, interventions such as the social behavior programs uh, that will actually make sure that um, we deal uh, uh, with male and, and, and male students as well as um, uh, male in the, in, 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 in the institutions just to raise awareness uh, on a number of things and engage a male in different discussions just to make sure that everyone is aware and perpetrators are brought to book. These are some of the interventions that we will be embarking on. And I think as the Commission for Gender Equality, we are also there to just provide gender sensitive training to institutions uh, that require such kind of intervention, just to make sure that everyone is gender sensitive and everyone knows what to do should we have challenges in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Tamara. I think I should take this time now to just, um, I, I do need to have a student leadership perspective on this. Sasha Lee is uh, the um, UWC SRC president. If we can please um, welcome Sasha Lee Douglas. Um, thank you, Ms. Masepa. Um, thank you for the platform and the opportunity. I hope that I am audible. I think many of the previous speakers touched on something that is incredibly key, which is that we need to move to a place of us starting to take action. Like Lucy said, a policy provision, a policy amendment, policy developments have absolutely no impact on our lives and our experiences in institutions of higher learning if it is not translated into practical measures being implemented in institutions of higher learning. I think that, let me first touch on the, the, the position of South. The South African Student Union of Students fortunately has direct access to the department. So they've been in a position where they've been able to advocate on behalf of students from various campuses and also in a position where they are able to bring the views of different SRCs across the country to the attention of the department. But I think we must always bear in mind that institutions of higher learning are able to hide behind institutional autonomy and then treat recommendations and positions of government as if it is optional. And we have to get to a, a, a point in, in, in our struggle against gender-based violence where we no longer say that universities should or that universities may. Universities should be required. It should be mandatory for each and every university to reflect on their policies. Institutions um, who do not have policies in place should be required to start a process of consultation with various stakeholders on their campuses and developing a policy. And they should all be required to have discussions around practical measures that should be implemented. And I say this because when you look at the students and their experiences in our campuses and in private accommodation, more often than not, there are measures that we can put in place to at the very least curtail or decrease the rate or provide more protection. A simple example would be students who reside in private accommodation do not have the same protection as students who stay on campus. Universities are able to employ private securities to come and abuse us and victimize us when we shut down campus for whatever reason, but they cannot employ the same private security companies to go and exist in the spaces where our students are residing in private accommodation and giving them just an additional level of protection. I also think it's another important measure that could be implemented is for universities to establish relationships with SEPs in the different communities where we find our institutions, both universities and TVETs, and also establish relationships with community protection units in our different communities. Because you'll find that more often than not, people want to do good. People just don't know where to access those who are walking towards a particular program of action. 
the South African Student Congress do have a gender policy in which they discuss extensively how we should go about achieving gender equality and how we should go about eradicating gender-based violence. And it speaks on various points, but I think the one thing that I do wish to highlight is the policy itself speaks of the establishment of a national gender okay. unit would ensure that the gender and safety officers on campuses across the country and the gender officer of the student union itself have a direct link between the upper structure and the students on our campuses. And this would ensure that there's a line of communication because unfortunately, at this moment in time, you find that the information that the department has access to mainly comes from institutions themselves. And institutions rely solely on what is reported to them as opposed to the lived experiences of our students because it is a fact to say that we have not created an environment that is safe enough for each and every person that is a survivor of a form of violence to speak up. So if we establish a link where student leaders can have access to the department directly, I think we would start seeing that the situation is way bigger than we think. For UWC, for example, to say we have no reported cases, it's fine because there are no reported cases because UWC has failed to create an environment where students can come and report. And in the off chance that they do report, we are faced with having to deal with misogyny. We are faced with having to deal with internal processes that seek to protect institutions. And I think it's important to understand that policies alone will not give us the kind of progress that we need. The document that we are speaking of today says that between 2016 and 2020, what's UB, um, roads, UCT had protests. These are all institutions with existing policies. UWC had a policy amendment in 2016. In 2019, September, we once again had to submit a memorandum of demands on the practical implementation of solutions that we need on our campuses. So the department, I think, must make sure that they make it clear to universities that you are not being asked to do anyone any favors. You are being asked to uphold the laws of this country. You are being asked to uphold a, a person's constitutional right to life, your constitutional right to freedom, your constitutional right to security of the person. And make sure that once we have given them this guideline, which I genuinely hope will at least fast track towards getting us to the progress that we want, I hope that we must attach a consequence for failure to comply with this document. It cannot be sufficient that we say, this is our recommendation and when institutions fail, there is no consequences while they continue to be funded by the department, while they continue to rely on student leaders to do A, B, C, D, E, while they continue to conduct themselves as if institutions operate outside of society at large. Um, the last point that I do wish to make is COVID-19 has shown us many things, but I think one of the greatest lessons that we should take from it is that government, institutions of higher learning, and any other departments are exceedingly capable of addressing issues when they want to. And I say this to say that how well we are able to address this issue depends on the urgency that we attach to gender-based violence itself. We've been speaking about this for the last five years. Students across the country have been marching since the, fees, the, the, the first Fees Must Fall movement up until 2020. But once we get to a space where we treat it with the necessary urgency and we start investing our resources, our efforts and our energy into actually finding solutions, we will see problems. And with the COVID pandemic, we saw that it's possible. It's possible for government to stand up and say, starting today, we are moving in a particular direction. Starting today, we are investing this amount of money towards a particular cause. So I want to appeal then to all departments and institutions and to government itself to keep that same energy for the gender-based violence pandemic because it has been correctly so called a pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Sasha Lee. I just quickly, even as we are running out of time, wanted to also give um, space to the TVET sector um, represented today by uh, Dr. Ripilo Anikutsisi, who's the deputy president of SACO, to just touch on how the TVET sector is, is, is uh, dealing with the scourge of de uh, gender-based violence and how the TVET sector is preparing itself for the implementation um, of the, uh, um, the PSET uh, uh, gender-based violence policy framework. Good morning, everyone. And thanks, Florence, uh, for the opportunity um, indeed, these are challenging times, and um, we are we find ourselves compelled to move from the, our comfort zones and deliver <clears throat> as a, the needs of our clientele. 
Um, let me first acknowledge the speech given by Nomvelo and um, Lucy. These are women of character, women of integrity. You stood to the test of times. You were tested beyond measure, but you are still standing. I also want to acknowledge in Tabiseng Rampai, Nombuiselo Chelake, Naledi Litoba, Sharon Vuyelwa, Precious Ramabulan. Those are women whose lives were lost in our sector. These are people that went through unfairness in the system. But they have proved beyond measure that their souls will never be forgotten. In 2016, the South African higher education institutions were confronted with numerous protest actions against sexual violence and gender-based violence to the attention of media and South African public at large. And sexual violence, it wasn't a new thing at that time. It has been there, but due to lack of coordinated effort and dedicated research, which gives clear picture of the extent thereof, these two phenomena received lesser attention. One other realization in our sector is underreporting on cases of gender-based violence and femicide. And this underreporting comes as a result of different interpretations and understandings that go with people within the sector. In most cases, people narrow gender-based violence to sexual harassment only, rather than looking deeper into what gender-based violence is and its different forms. Gender-based violence in peace sector, in particular Tibet colleges, um, include but not limited to rape, intimate partner violence, sexual harassment, domestic violence. And students can sometimes experience contact and non-contact sexual offenses. And this, in most cases, as we heard from the two ladies, can have negative consequences on them. They feel unsafe to walk about. They feel their self-esteem gets tinted. They feel unprotected, unloved. It affects their mental status. And there are a number of risk factors that we are faced with within the sector in terms of gender-based violence on campus. When students register at Tivet colleges, due to high level of prevalence on gender-based violence against children in South Africa, many of our students come to college with previous experience, exposure to sexual violence. This cuts across gender. For males with prior victimization, this increases the risk of gender-based violence per perpetrators. For females, it increases the risk of being victimized again, them displaying withdrawal syndrome, and in some cases, violent conduct against other students. The other risk factor is age. In our sector, we've got different age categories. If one has to make an example, NCV attracts students that come from grade nine, fresh from school. Native programs would attract grade 12 uh, students. And in our sector, we also cater for those that are in the world of work, already experience, experienced and bringing different life experiences. Young females are often at a higher risk of gender-based violence. And research has proven that first years women are in most cases most vulnerable. Young women between ages, young men between ages of 18 and 24 are likely to be perpetrators. Being away from home for, for the first time with so much freedom to experiment can be overwhelming to our students. They tend to experiment on all forms of violence including sexual violence and drug abuse and substance abuse. 
Social norms also we have realized within the sector that can influence gender-based violence, sexual violence, and finally, femicide. To cite but a few, things like male superiority, sexual entitlement can exacerbate gender-based violence. Institutional culture also has a likelihood of encouraging gender-based violence occurring at campuses. In, in our campuses, especially the engineering faculties or engineering uh, campuses, they are mostly male-dominated campuses where masculinity and gender imbalances are the order of the day. And they can pose at sometimes a risk of gender-based violence, as well as to slow the response to gender-based violence cases. In such cases, gender imbalances need attention right from the point of entry. That is during enrollment planning and registration. Female biased funding needs to be encouraged within the department so as to ensure the increase of female students in more male dominated programs. One other risk that we have identified within our sector is lack of awareness programs, which also have a likelihood of gender-based violence increasing among staff and students. Uh, there's likelihood that reporting such incidents would be perceived as a taboo and that uh, promotes poor or under reporting, no reporting for cases um, that are taking place at our institutions. Individuals believe that it might take uh, the integrity of their institutions as they increasingly report on cases of gender-based violence and femicide. The design and location of campuses can pose a risk in campuses where there are many buildings, dark places, it poses a, a risk of harboring gender-based violence. In lecture halls, students sometimes go there when there is no one and wanting to study and finding a space for them to study uh, well. But in some cases, it becomes an unfortunate situation to go through. During excursions, students might uh, be, be, be marked and be taken advantage of by their male counterparts. And what do we do as TVET colleges to deal with this pandemic, to deal with scourge of gender-based violence? The point of departure in every aspect in education is legislative framework. The Continuing Education and Training Act 16 of 2006 is amended requires TVET colleges to incorporate disciplinary codes which delineate any form of unfair discrimination, violence and harassment of any form, including gender-based violence. And college councils as custodians of governance framework within colleges developed policies. But as the Commission for Gender Equality indicated, we were found wanting in as far as gender-based violence policies or sexual harassment policies are concerned. Tivet colleges have got units of student support services, which are governed by the student support services framework. And they do, the, they develop their student support services annual plan, which relates to three key pillars in the student support services. The pre-entry, the on-course and exit support. During pre-entry, we, we have contracting and code of conduct, which most of our students uh, get trained on upon registration. It details all forms of violence, drug, drug abuse and substance abuse, and zero, zero tolerance to it. Students are workshopped and guided, guided on the contents thereof for them to be able to know what is acceptable within our institutions. In terms of on-course support, among others, we have talks on life skills and counseling services, academic support as well as personal support. In the annual plan for student support services, 
in order for us to improve chances of academic su success and improve on the integrity of young women and men who are in our institutions, we have to look at their well-being. In most cases, Tibet colleges are confronted with a challenge of students with a big age difference and coming from different social backgrounds. As I indicated earlier that in our programs would attract students of different ages. This poses a challenge for a very young girl who is inexperienced and overwhelmed by the situation that she finds herself in within the institution to cope with the challenges that she's faced with. And as colleges, we have to put systems in place to be able to deal with this sketch and the pandemic. SRCs are an integral part of student life and is a critical cooperative governance partner in a college. SRCs are therefore there to enhance student life on campuses. And they are there to empower and invest in people and make a gender equality and equity part and puzzle of their constitutions. I earlier on made reference to pre-entry support. Most colleges do have that, but like all other policies as indicated earlier, the success of any policy or guidelines or any system depends on the people behind it. Pre-entry support is a procedural information session which strives towards students' academic and social inter integration at the college. It is there to enable students to deal with the transition from previous experience to a Tivet college environment. But in the absence of such a structured program, students take longer to adapt uh, to, and become, they tend to become withdrawn. They fail to cope and become victims of manipulation and violence gender-based violence included. Over and above orientation and induction, colleges have peer mentorship programs, which assist in academic and social integration at our colleges. As part of on-course support, personal support is also provided. It empowers students' uh, self-esteem, and we use group activities and other activities as coping mechanisms for students to face life challenges. There's counseling and referrals at, at Tivet colleges that we are using to support our students. And we also have got provision of life skills programs um, that we are implementing to support students. Student health and wellness programs where higher health plays a prominent role and we've also pro have got provision of primary health care services to students. And um, we have established partnerships with various stakeholders, such as the Department of Social Development, the SAPS mm -hmm. and other NGOs to support students. And this colleges participate in high health activations programs as part of other mechanisms to strengthen support base for students. Yes, there's still a lot of work to be done to initiate programs that address the scourge of gender-based violence and to support victims, including perpetrators, and to establish campus resident and resident safety committees and early alert systems to report incidents. Program director, let me pause and indicate that we are already communicating a SACPO to address the issues of students like Nomvelo who are going through tough times. And I think it is calling upon us as leadership to hold hands with the student leadership. I like the courage that they both displayed with Lucy and also Sasha Lee young women of your nature and character, help others who are going through tough times like you to get up and take courage and face the future. Let me thank you, Program Director, 
and apologies for taking longer. I thank you. What I take away from today, however, is that a lot more needs to be done. As Sasha Lee and Lucy and Mvula have clearly set out their, their perspectives, a lot more needs to be done. And I just want to, in summation, say that we're very grateful for the coherent, integrated policy and the direction that government is taking leadership in this specific matter. And that as we look at the university, we must understand that it's an ecosystem. It's an ecosystem of academics, it's an ecosystem of our students, it's an eco ecosystem of our support staff, our visitors, and, and a myriad of stakeholders. So all of us are collectively and jointly responsible and accountable for what it is that we do. And we must not fail our students by not creating an enabling and inclusive environment. So just in summation, Dr. Rumik, I just want to say that if I take away from, from what the minister said and what our earlier speaker said, if we don't have a process of inclusion, prevention, action, and above all, accountability and consequences for perpetrators, and if we don't support enabling change, we will never see true change. It will just be another talk shop. It will just be another process of not making <clears throat> meaningful change. So we see as the university sector that whatever it is that we're doing, that a lot more can be done. And we look forward to working with all of our stakeholders to realize this. And, and we really want to take this opportunity in closing to thank the ministry and to thank Higher Health for everything and for leading this process. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I think with me, even losing power there, it's a sign that we have been in this discussion for quite a long time, but I'd like to appeal that our guests remain with us because there are inputs that I, I, I want us to still go through, Dr. Ramnik. Um, I will ask you and the Deputy Minister, as well as Tamara, to just deal with some of the questions that we've had coming through the chat. Mm -hmm.